Thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming here today. My name is Kara Swisher. I'm the person Travis Kalanick won't sit down with, so I'm very appreciative that you guys didn't cancel today. Um, you have guts. Or more, more to the point, he has none. Um, so <laughs> I'm, this, is a, this is a really good panel about a lot of really important issues facing the tech industry, and this is a great group of people to do this. Um, it's called Trends Shaping Technology Business and Society, which is not the most exciting uh, title there, but it most should be tech, oh no, what's coming next? Um, and a lot of things are getting very serious in tech uh, around AI, around automation, robotics, and all kinds of things. So we're going to talk about those things and some trends today. But I'd like each of you to introduce yourselves. Um, why don't we start with you, Devin, and then move on down. Uh, Devin briefly. Wenning, I'm CEO of eBay. Yes, eBay, we've heard of it. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Hans Tom from uh, TGV. We were early investor in Alibaba. Uh, Oscar Salazar, I, I built a prototype that right now is uh, called Uber. Um, I was the first guy who built a prototype in the technology. And then I'm co-founder of um, Pager, which is a healthcare navigation um, platform uh, that I can explain later. Great, fantastic. I'm Belinda Johnson, and I'm Chief Business Affairs and Legal Officer at Airbnb. Uh, I'm Adrian Aoun. Uh, I have a new healthcare startup called Forward, and prior to this was the head of special projects at Alphabet. Great. So let's get started about what the state of technology is. I think a lot of people, recently Sam Altman gave an interview where he talked about where jobs are going. And I think jobs is at the heart of a lot of this. A lot of people are talking about this. And one of the things he said struck me quite a bit, which was that any repetitive job that doesn't have an emotional and creative element is gone going forward because of what's coming down the pike in technology. I'd like to start with you, Devin. What, what do you imagine the most important technologies coming next are uh, among the many that are coming? Because they're much more serious than social media or anything else that's happened before in the past couple of years. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, I think Sam is right, and it may be more than that. I'm not sure that only uh, repetitive jobs are going to be impacted. I, I mean, this is such a big topic. The way that we tend to organize technology, which is so wild and woolly, is in these big platform moves. And at the risk of being a little oversimplistic, I think there are three. And it's actually when the platforms move that society gets the most impacted. For us, we look at the world as there's AI, there's VR and AR, and there's Internet of Things, distributed uh, commerce, whatever you want to call it. And these are all, they're related, but they're actually slightly separate, big platform shifts that are coming. The net impact of that, if you look back in history when platforms, computing platforms moved, they are always net job creators. The question is when, and the question is how deep is the trough? I think one of the concerns is that this trough might be very deep. And I do think that this is not a fanciful 20-year issue, you know, I think that cab drivers are going to start losing their jobs in New York and San Francisco in three to five years. And I think that if you look at uh, the impact, it's going to be quite profound. And it's too flippant to say, well, let's just train uh, cab, cab drivers or, or other uh, people that are going to be impacted and make them computer scientists. That's not plausible. So we have to have a long-term perspective. And I do think Silicon Valley has to own this issue. It can't be flippant about it and just say, well, here's awesome technology and it is what it is because we're going to create a lot of value. I think that it, 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 driving inequality and driving job losses isn't good for anybody. So okay. we've got to figure this out. All right, Adrian? Yeah, so I think it's really interesting. Um, you know, uh, part of my background is I spent a lot of time in AI. And um, what's always interesting to me is that everybody out there says AI is coming and it's going to eat all of our jobs. But then if I ask my phone to order me some pizza, it has no clue what to do. Mm -hmm. So I think the only people that don't believe AI is coming anytime soon are the ones that are actually working on it right now. Because frankly, we're really, really at the beginning. Um, I think that w the reason so many people think that we're so, uh, so close to the verge of AI coming is because of the, uh, the dichotomy you created at the beginning, which is we look at creative jobs and we say, well, if jobs are creative, then only humans can do them. Computers can't. It turns out that our mental model of how we define which jobs computers were comfortable with computers doing, the rote, uncreative tasks, it turns out that that mental model makes a lot of sense to humans, but computers just don't abide by it. So 
as an example, computers these days using deep learning are creating artwork. They're creating music. They're actually writing prose. And we traditionally look at that as very creative sorts of elements. So when we see that, we say, wow, there must be intelligence inside of it. But the truth is there's not, because that same computer can't, can't love, that same computer can't actually reason any sort of complex tasks. So when I think of, uh, when I think of the transformations that are happening, I think that um, we're going to start seeing many, many sectors that we wouldn't have predicted. We're going to start seeing those be obliterated by AI, and I totally agree with that, and I think there is a big concern about jobs. But I think that the, the alternative question of, well, are these robots going to you know, eat us alive? I think we're incredibly far off from that, and that little nuance is incredibly important. Well, some, someone at Google actually just observed that they don't care about us, and in fact, when, we did an, when I did an interview with Elon Musk last year, he said, actually, they don't they don't want to kill us, they're going to treat us like house cats, um, <laughs> right. rather than that. All right, uh, Hans, your thoughts on the most important? Well, I, I think there will be more people like Elon Musk who will figure out a way to have AI to be something that would enable people to do their job better. Um, I think um, for, for us, many of us who spend a lot of time both in the US and China, I think October uh, 2015 was a seminal uh, time. When, uh, before um, AlphaGo take on this at all, uh, almost everyone in China thought deep, you know, deep Mind had no chance at all. And after the first uh, two uh, um, matches, everyone was shocked. It feels like 1839 with the first opium war. What the hell are we going to do? Um, so with, with the initial shock, it's easy to say, oh my God, AI is taking over. But over time, I think there are ways to integrate the two and make human job that's even more, more efficient. You know, that's interestingly what actually Elon is more not like, does not think He, he worries about it, yeah. therefore he feels that he needs to do something to help human to deal with it, or else he'll become, like you said, well, I think a, 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 a home, home cat. Yeah, I think his worries, or most of the people in technology put it as a shiny, happy future. Right, it's and, not. And exactly. They and need he, to deal with it, or else you will end up being extremely unhappy. Including who controls it, and I yes. think his worries were Google, And biases, Facebook. and who takes responsibility for these Right, and so right, and his, and his point was that who writes it, which right. is largely... Again, what a surprise, white men. Um, yeah. Right, so, Belinda, <laughs> speaking of white men, um, what, what are your concerns? You know, at, at, you're mm -hmm. using these technologies mm -hmm. at Airbnb, and obviously you've disrupted all kinds mm -hmm. of industries. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, so, for sure, we use machine learning to improve our platform and our experience for our community, but um, the thing that makes Airbnb really special is... is kind of the host interaction and that sense of um, human connection. And that can't really be automated. And so as we continue to grow, it's this focus on um, those social connections. And, um, and we've, we just recently did a job study um, that showed that uh, the Airbnb community supported last year 730,000 additional jobs. We were looking at 1.3 million additional jobs being supported by the Airbnb community in 2017. So I think there's ways to kind of not necessarily counterbalance completely, but ways that um, the sharing economy and platforms that bring kind of humans together can uh, counterbalance some of the impact. All right. And now, Oscar, since you architected Uber, and I think Uber is probably um, the, the, the company that has, has shown this the most, the idea of, of, of dis not just disrupting an industry, but decimating it and creating another one from it. Um, and as you, you may or may not have known, when Travis did get on the stage with me last time, he actually told the truth, which was unusual for him. And uh, what he did was say, I said, what do you think about self-driving cars? This is about five, four years ago, I think. And he said, you know what? The real problem for Uber's business is the guy sitting in the front seat. If I can get rid of him, I can make a lot of money. And of course, there was a sharp intake of breath because he was saying he'd like to get rid of all human beings in the cars. And I said, oh, please tell me more. And he goes, yeah, it's a real problem. And once we get rid of them, we'll be great. And then he realized what he had done and said, well, that's 20 years down the road. But really the essence of Uber is that idea of ultimately getting rid of people or not, or not. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't work for Uber. No, I know, but you architected it, right? <laughs> but uh, but, but uh, I, I think, yes, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, what Uber is is... Um, it's, an, it's, a, it's a mobile marketplace. It was the first, the first mobile marketplace in the history of, uh, of the planet. So connected supply and demand using smartphones. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the, that's, the, that's the biggest takeaway. I think for me, at the end of the day, you know, just coming back to uh, 
Um, the real challenge for AI is not only to replace repetitive tasks, but also to uh, replace what I call information gatekeepers. Information gatekeepers are people that are, they sit in front of a lot of information and then they charge you money for, uh, for these insights. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is a second, the second group that is going to be disrupted. It could be lawyers, it could be doctors, mm -hmm. uh, all, these, all these people that they sit you know, behind all this experience, accountants. Um, and they charge and broke their information brokers pretty much and, and we're very very close to that You know um, just coming from a, from my healthcare experience is uh, one of the biggest problems in, in healthcare right now is, is triage is the fundamental triage piece is when you are sick There's uh, you can make 10,000 decisions you can you know for, you can do nothing you can call 911 You can call your doctor friend you can go to Web, WebMD and find out that you're going to have, you know, you're going to die in three days because you have a cancer and mm -hmm. then freak out and go to the ER. Mm -hmm. So there's so many things. And then healthcare has so many entry points. So the fact that it's uh, that's so broken is, uh, I think, um, applying uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, can, we, you can guide the patient, you know, through that. So at the end of the day, I don't think machine learning is going to replace or get, or get rid of jobs. You know, um, I think it's going to fundamentally change industries and the job destruction is going to be just an outcome. I don't think we're looking for, I don't, I don't think anybody's building companies to get rid of humans. I think we're creating efficiencies. Uh, and, and, uh, but I'm with Devin. I think we need to, uh, to you know, take accountability right. uh, and, uh, and, and think ahead. That I don't think anybody is actually doing well, this. Let's talk about that accountability of where it is. And I do want to get into automation and robotics too, because it's related and much quicker, actually, automation particularly. Um, who is responsible? Because one of the things, and it's not just in this area, not just in AI, but automation and robotics and all kinds of things. Um, and even, even Mark Zuckerberg's famous 6,000-word essay, which none of you should read. You should read our, anyone's version of it, um, which is great. But the concept is maybe this platform isn't as benign as we thought it was. Maybe there are impacts that I hadn't thought of. Maybe it isn't such a beautiful suburb where everybody gets along. So who, Silicon Valley tends not to want to take responsibility for the platforms they build. Maybe it's because they're young. I, I don't know. So let's talk about that. Like the idea of who's, because a lot of what Trump has pushed out is that you know, tech has ruined all these jobs and now they have to fix them. Or Apple should open a, a plant in Kentucky. It doesn't seem to be the solution to the problem. But talk about accountability, because Devin, you brought it up for the fir in the first. I mean, first of all, I don't think the answer is constraining innovation. That never works. So saying that we shouldn't innovate is a loser because that does, in the long run, create jobs and it drives human society forward. But that's a far pole from saying there's no accountability for what these platforms do in the real world. You know, I just, first of all, this, is, this panel is a great example. I don't think we directly spoke about it, but there are a lot of jobs being created in the sharing economy that are already relying on machine learning and AI. We don't need to get to this amazing end state of the robots have us as pets. Mm -hmm. to say the reality is that I've got a million small businesses that are exporters on eBay and they're hiring people, they're self-sufficient and they're growing. That doesn't, however, mean that there aren't second and third level effects. In our neck of the woods, look at the retail industry. I mean, you know, we're far from the ultimate uh, vision of AI or, or machine learning, but by some studies, a quarter of the jobs in the United States are supported by the retail industry and they're in trouble. And it's technology that's created that. So, I, look, I think that uh, championing things like education, championing the skills that are going to be needed in the new economy, we're missing a great opportunity right now with this immigration debate to not have the other side, which is why aren't we educating students in the United States to get ready for the economy that's coming that's going to be shaped by the trends that we're talking about? Why isn't computer science and STEM education mandatory for K through 12 students in this country? We ought to be having both sides of that discussion. Okay, Adrian? So uh, I think that conversation is being had. I agree with you that it's not being um, had enough. That being said, I'm not sure that that's actually a solution. So one of the things that, that these technology disruptions cause is that the, they cause the, uh, the individual that's losing their job to have to retool at a faster and faster and faster rate. And we've been lucky for us. We say, oh, new technology comes out. We're pretty familiar with technology. We can keep up with it. But you know, things are going to happen at a faster and faster rate to the point where we're going to look like those old curmudgeons that can't keep up. And then we're going to be the ones on the other side going, wait a minute, I wish government was taking care of me. When I think about 
about, um, when I think about job loss, there's, all, there's, um, there's also a positive that comes of these things that we don't spend enough time talking about, right? So when you look at uh, a company like Airbnb, you say, okay, you know, maybe, maybe people in the hotel uh, world are losing jobs, but then again, there's, there are people that ha can now afford homes that couldn't otherwise afford homes because they can rent them out. When I look at my company forward, um, there's no question that we're getting rid of an enormous amount of efficiencies in the healthcare world, but we're doing it for the purpose of being able to lower the cost and increase the accessibility of healthcare to people who can't afford good healthcare. So you have to go ahead and, and kind of look at both sides of the coin and say, yes, maybe we're losing some jobs, but we're also helping sometimes incredibly needy, um, incredibly needy people. And that's really important too. But the part that I think that we spend, um, we spend a lot of time focused on AI without really thinking about the deconstructing uh, parts that feed into it, right? Whether that's uh, nanotechnology, whether that's material science, whether that's genomics, whatever it happens to be, AI only works because of all of these other advances that kind of feed into it, that give it the data that it needs, that give it the, uh, the information to be able to process. But it turns out that each one of those um, deconstructed technologies, even if you ignored AI, have massive, massive impacts that we're kind of ignoring in this whole conversation. So when I think about gene editing, which obviously now is being able to be done with the advances of computers, et cetera, well, ignore AI. What's it going to look, you know, ignore robots coming up onto this stage. What's it going to look like when people in this audience have three arms? What's it going to look like when people in this audience can control their levels of intelligence? Uh, what kind of world does that create? So I think we're getting a little too hung up on one particular notion of what the future is going to look like without really thinking through all the impacts. You know, honestly, I'd never thought of people with three arms, but thank you for that <laughs> image. Um, I enjoy it. Wow. Okay. Um, Oscar, talk about that concept of that who's responsible, because I think, again, I, I, think, yeah. I do think Silicon Valley is caught in a perpetual adolescent yeah. moment, and it's a really bad adolescent who doesn't feel like they have responsibility for anything. Um, and they often say that, like you're with people from any of these companies, and they, they usually start by saying, well, people can do whatever they want, people, you know, the libertarian part of their personality. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, well, if you didn't have, for example, it was someone at Google I was talking to, um, and they said, people can do whatever they want. And I said, well, if you didn't have a thousand engineers trying to make me push that red button, I'd believe you believe that, but you don't. This is a slot machine for attention, for, for behavior, for everything else. So w what responsibility do they have? I think we are, um, you know, all of us have, you know, responsibility as a society. The pro you know, what I don't see, is I see a lot of people building technology, pushing technology forward, but I don't see people really thinking about the social consequences right. of these technologies. So we're still debating whether Uber or Airbnb is legal in CDX or B, you know, on regulations, stuff like that. So what worries me is that nobody's um, sitting down uh, rethinking, you know, how regulation is going to look like in the next 10 years. So we're using 19th century techniques to solve 21st century problems. Uh, we're relying on documents and laws that were created like almost 200 years ago and try to implement. So there's a, an anachronism that is, that is... So I think we're all responsible, you know, when you hand over a, a, a cell phone, you know, to a 10-year-old without really understanding the impact that you're going to create in, in, in her life. or is You're actually just doing it and not thinking about how it's shaping their life. And these this young users are just um, creating their own you know, form of communication, their own uh, social etiquette, mm -hmm. their own social uh, rules. You know, that's why we see you know, bullying uh, you know, coming, you know, going higher and higher, because we're shaping a society by adding technology to society without thinking about the consequences. We are creating different subcultures, you know, that we need all, all need to address. So I think we're all responsible. I don't think company X or B should be um, the one that should address these problems. I think government, uh, industry, and civil society, we need to work more together and start debating these kind of topics because it's just going to get crazier and crazier. So we don't tend to do that. I mean, well, you're a lawyer. Um, you've dealt with regulatory issues yeah. all over, and that's one thing that a lot of these companies are fighting, mm -hmm. including the healthcare companies and others um, with government. And at the same time, we're seeing a political system now that's rebelling against that idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a debate about kind of the increasing power of platforms and what the responsibilities are. Um, and if you look historically at the, at the beginning kind of of the internet, 
a platform's position was, it's not us, we're just bringing these people, to, we are not responsible for what happens on the platform. And there's a lot of good policy reasons for that because you didn't want to stifle growth and innovation. But I think today... You also it, didn't want to be legally responsible. Um, well, and they're, well, putting the laws aside, I think today the expectations of the communities of the platforms and the customers are much, much higher. And so if you're taking that position and you're not leaning in, then you're mismatching your customers' expectations. And so for us, for things like regulatory, um, working with cities, you know, we're often very aligned on kind of the outcome we want in a city, it's about how you get there. And traditionally, platforms have been saying, not our responsibility to enforce, it's the government's responsibility to enforce. But some of the, the arrangements that we've been working out with cities, um, uh, we're working together to make that happen. Like the, the um, settlement we just announced in San Francisco today, a city might have a, a form of regulation that requires um, maybe offline <laughs> um, process, and we can bring that online and help with the enforcement without taking on, you know, kind of the extra burdens and, and help enable hosts to be able to host more easily. So I think absolutely um, the evolution here should be um, platforms taking on more responsibility. Mm -hmm. But look at the city of New York where you're having all kinds of trouble. Mm -hmm. um, put it from the New Yorker's perspective, what point, good point do they have to what Airbnb is doing to the market there? You know, I, I think... Um, there, there might be a lot of misinformation in New York about um, the number of housing units that are getting taken off the market. When uh, we first heard feedback around uh, affordability issues from the city years ago, um, you know, that is not the place that we wanted to be with cities. Our, part of our mission is to help enrich the cities that we serve. And so we launched, um, this is again self-regulation, uh, a one host, one home policy so that that the, the home in which you're renting in New York has to be your primary home. And so that uh, addresses kind of this issue that potentially uh, landlords are taking long-term housing off the market and putting it on short-term rental. But, but we'd love to you know, build regulation that um, makes that easy to comply with. And right now we're working to just do that more manually. And it is only through partnerships with government that we can kind of reach these, these kind of better solutions. But doesn't your cities. government, doesn't your business rely on more houses on the market, more short-term short houses on the market? Or not? I, I, well, but there's no shortage of, I think the, the census is, there, there are millions of rooms available in the U.S. Um, that are vacant. And so uh, it's, it's absolutely, um, that, I, mean, I don't have an issue with the kind right. of inventory. But what issue. I mean is, do you think there's a change of thinking at Airbnb where maybe we do have some responsibility towards what could be happening? Uh, um, I wouldn't say that, that we're necessarily kind of a cause and effect, but we are invested in making sure that we are not part of the problem. And so um, some of the, like I said, we're very aligned on making sure that we're having positive impacts on cities. And when we're thinking about regulation, we're not just looking at smart regulation, but we're looking at how do we partner with cities um, for things like disaster relief and bringing tourism into cities. And um, in these neighborhoods that haven't gotten to benefit from local tourism, 76% of our listings are outside of hotel districts. This is bringing a whole source of revenue into kind of local mom and pops and helping them stay afloat. And so it's through those partnerships that we can work together. But, um, but yes, I think, I think what you'll see with some of the deals that we're doing with cities is um, us leaning in and working through how do we satisfy cities' concerns and build um, an enforcement mechanism that works for our users, for us, and for the city. Great. And Hans, you invest in a lot of companies like this. Do, they, do you feel they understand the responsibility or, or it doesn't matter at all? I think you care in, at all as an investor, you just want your money. Be, be, being in Silicon Valley, it's easy to uh, drink the Kool-Aid and say innovation is everything. And innovation definitely is important. However, if you look at, um, just we did a simple analysis of um, just the top 10, top five uh, market cap uh, companies in the world, 10 years ago versus now. 10 years ago of top five, only Microsoft is, is in it. Everyone else, GE, uh, BP, all the offline industrial players. These days, it's Facebook, it's, uh, it's, it's Amazon, it's, uh, it's Apple, Apple. Uh, still Microsoft. But it, the tech companies have benefited substantially over the last 10 years. And if any, anybody learned anything from this election, is that it's very easy to paint that as the culprit because you're not sharing that with everyone else as much as you should. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're just, even out of self-preservation, right. um, thinking longer term, just investing a lot more, hiring a lot more um, uh, into the state schools, the top state schools all around the country, uh, if not the world, it's much a more effective way than the way it is doing now. It's easy, and you look at the, the makeup of the tech companies in, in the Valley, 
most people end up going there tend to be people from um, the Ivy Leagues, the Stanford, UC Berkeley, CMEUs, the, the typical schools. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some from other schools, but have you figured out a way to get down to the top 100 computer science programs in the country and give more people more chance, set up a more developed centers in other parts of the country beyond the top five, six cities? One of the things that I, as a student in history, what I love to, to study was that how um, countries or nations, empires, dynasties over a period of time, over a generation, figure out a way to come up with an examination system so that people from the bottom of the, the society have a chance to rise up. Without that, it gets really stale very quickly. It's not just stale, but dangerous, too. Yes, revolution is right. how that started. Yeah, you might, yeah. So let's talk about that concept, because I was on another thing recently, and someone said... Um, a third of the country, we'll talk about this, just the US, uh, the US itself, a third of the country believes in the future and benefits from it, some of whom benefit enormously and, and love it, think it's great, leaning right into it. A third of the country at the bottom is not benefiting at all. They hate it, they're scared of it, they don't want it, they resist it. And there's a big group, not even a third, there's a bigger group in the middle of yes. people that know technology is important want to embrace it, but have a vague sense yes. that they are screwed, you know what I mean, by this, and, and yep. they will get hurt, and they don't quite know what to do. It's that group. Now, the bottom group has really spoken in this election in a lot right. of ways with populism. That next group is probably the more substantive group of people that are, are pro- it's problematic. So talk a little bit, of, talk each of you about this concept of like what, what has happened in this election, because I do think it's the bottom group that, is very terrified, and this middle group is very much um, prone to um, being flipped in that, in the same manner. And it's the dangerous, you know, populism can be very dangerous when it's taken to those extremes. And the only example I'll give is now there's new robots in San Francisco delivering food, right? Because San Francisco is where everybody's thing starts um, in a lot of ways. And people have been kicking them, you know, as they deliver the food. And I'm thinking, wow, they're kicking them in San Francisco, which seems a very San Francisco thing to do to kick a robot. <laughs> but at the same time, is there's a vague sense in your lizard brain that this is bad for you. This, this food-delivering robot is a problem for you eventually, even if you're an artist or a musician or whatever. So talk about what's happened in our country, because I do think that middle group of people is where the critical elements lie. Why don't you start, Oscar? Uh, I think it, com- it comes back. I don't think... Um you know, in the technology industry, including myself, we're doing a good job um, educating and raising awareness um, about the benefits of, of our creations, you know, to the society. I think we're focused on uh, grow, 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 uh, and, you know, expansion, expansion, expansion without, and you know what, sometimes you have to do it because this is the way you raise money and capital. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, innovation needs to be explained. You know, uh, right now we're, we have the... Um, you know, we're lucky that we're educated and we understand we live in this, in this world so we can actually understand, you know, that robots delivering pizza, pizza are not gonna, are not gonna kill me. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, we need to understand, I think this is one of the problems, you know, in the, in, in, in the world, not only in the country, populism is going, from, is moving from south to the north. And it's, it's the lack of communication and the oversimplification of things. It's like, oh, these guys, they don't understand, they're idiots. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, I don't think they're idiots. Uh, they are living a different reality than you are living. I think it's our job, you know, to to create and re- educate and raise awareness, you know, and connect these two worlds. If we're able to connect the entire world, you know, uh, using technology, I don't think we're uh, we're doing a good job, you know, sending the right message, you know, to the to the rest of the population. And I think um, that's uh, including myself. You know, um, I started, you know, to do so. I started, you know, to. Uh, do some uh, tours in the, to the Midwest to try to understand, you know, what their mm-hmm. problems are. Uh, and it's great to see, you know, that, you know, I, I, I met a guy who's building a startup. It's called Swine, Swine Tech. So they're using machine learning to detect when the pig is actually crossing, crushing the piglets. Mm. So with that, just using the sound waves, they can actually... Swine inc- Tech? Swine Tech. is amazing. Right. So they're actually increasing production 20%, which mm-hmm. is crazy. Uh, so, you know, the guys were speaking with this, and, it's, and I was like, oh, this is, this is insane. I would never thought about it. So I think there's, we live in different worlds right now, uh, and we need to somehow, you know, to collaborate more. Um, otherwise, I, I totally see a completely polarized society and, and a potential, you know, unrest if we, yeah. don't, if we don't address it. Although the visiting thing is real big among tech people. It's really interesting. I mean, you obviously all saw Mark feeding a cat, Mark Zuckerberg feeding a calf today. 
which oh, was I'm, disturbing in so many not. ways. Um, but <laughs> yeah. you, you can watch, he's on a tractor, he's feeding a calf. I don't quite know what he's doing, but, he, but it, I, I just tweeted when worlds collide, because um, him and a farmer okay. were sitting yeah, I, there. I didn't see that picture. I'm, I'm, it's I'm, super expensive I'm, sneakers I'm not on, on I'm too. not on Facebook, okay. I'm not on social media. Okay, all right, well, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, but talk about that concept, because there's a lot of busy, Sam Altman went on a tour um, of the Midwest, the same thing, Y Combinator, mm -hmm. the idea that I'm gonna go meet the people, and. I think the person who was interviewing joked, what did you get in your self-driving car and head on out to like Mississippi to meet the regular people? And so it's sort of like this concept of you have to go meet them. Like it, it sort of is insulting to everyone and all around. <laughs> so what do you ima imagine has happened? So I think that there's, uh, it's kind of interesting. The, the thing I agree with you earlier is that um, the, the tech community has done a poor job of self-preservation in the long term, if you think about it, right? So, so I think there's a few kind of, uh, we talk about the, the technology trends um, shaping society, but not the kind of social trends that have come from that. Sure. And there's a few that I, uh, that I spent a lot of time thinking about. The first is that we are far more connected um, today than we have ever been before. Ignoring uh, Oscar, who's not on uh, Facebook, the rest of us <laughs> probably are. And, uh, and by being on Facebook, what we're doing is we're not only allowing each other to communicate, but we're also doing a very interesting thing, which is we're giving all of our information to a central repository. And typically that scene is very creepy and very scary, but it's actually incredibly powerful when you do it. Yeah. Because what it does is allows all of us to be informed at a much greater level, because when you're using Google, when you're using Facebook, when you're using most kind of modern products, what they're doing is they're taking the collective intelligence and they're putting it at your fingertips, right? So we go from being connected to being informed. But then there's a third thing that comes of this. And this is something that we've seen a lot in the most recent election um, and more and more even with things like Arab Spring, et cetera, which is, which is society has also become far more volatile and far more fickle. Because so us, in other words, we all know we hate each other now. Much better. <laughs> Until we don't, and then we do again a week later. Um, okay. we're, if you look it, even at, uh, at polling numbers uh, you know, 20 years ago to today, the amount of variance from one poll to another is increasing just rapidly. And so the thing that I, I spend a good amount of time thinking about is volatility is uh, sometimes really great. And in a society, it's typically incredibly scary. Mm -hmm. Because I do think that at some point, uh, you know, folks that, that we are more disconnected from in this media we're, those folks are going to come up to us one day with pitchforks and say, what the hell are you doing to my society? Mm -hmm. um, and we're not prepared for that. And ironically, all these tools that have made everybody else informed have made us, in many ways, myopic. Right, okay. Hans? Um, I think the, the running joke in, in the Valley, I think in the beginning of this year, was that people are always planning, what if a day of a couple has come, how would you run away? How would you be able to fight Well, they fight want to go to New people? Zealand, right? <laughs> right, and it's, it's kind of sad that that's the solution to mm -hmm. this issue. Um, I wish there are a more proactive ways to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, and 18 months ago, 24 months ago, we had an internal discussion, and just seeing what was happening in Europe in different parts of Asia, how the have-nots are really speaking up, it wasn't as hard for us to see how the election in the U.S. will turn away this because it's just not in the U.S., but part of a global trend. And as much as I, I love to use numbers that, you know, back in 2000, there was less than 100, um, less than uh, 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 two, 300 million users in the world, and now we have uh, 2 billion, um, when we move on 3 billion, there's still a lot of places that people are just not having access to technology and the benefits technology can bring. So I think it's a much bigger issue that I think the tech companies, again, out of self deprivation preservation should, should take a more active role to solve it. Yeah, it's interesting because I think they, um, they this, this trend they're talking about is called prepping. I don't know if you've heard of it. There's a very good story in The New Yorker. It's the people <laughs> inventing the future have an exit plan. And actually one of them was like, Kara, what's your exit plan? I said, I'm going to shoot you in the head and take your things. <laughs> that's the plan I have and it will work beautifully. <laughs> um, so, uh, Belinda, what do you think about it? Because it really is a, a really, you know, the the volatility seems more so, and, and it is aimed at tech in lots of ways, and, and tech innovations. Is, and this has happened before, you know, you had the Luddites, you've had, at every major juncture of a, of a especially a technology juncture, you see this. Um, but people, as Adrian said, have things at their fingertips, now information at their fingertips, to use, to use well and to use badly. I mean, we literally have a president who's the best troller of Twitter ever like can use Twitter as a trolling mechanism and, and does it effectively to, to get his base uh, enraged. So talk about that concept. Well, I, you know, a few things. I think you mentioned people are more connected now than ever, but, um, 
but these are online connections. And so, you know, you go that next step, and I think what people are seeking out is more um, human connection. And if you believe, like many experts do, that basic human instinct is human connection, and the extent to which we are having those connections today is not what people need, then you can look to companies like Airbnb, sharing economy companies, to fill that gap, um, and that can't be automated. And so I think it's incumbent on some of the um, innovative companies to think about, as we're innovating, how do we do it in a way that economically empowers the people? And what we, we definitely heard or, and saw firsthand and around the globe in the events from last year, um, that people are feeling insecure from an economic perspective. And so what can we um, as platforms do to help that? And for us, you know, we have an economic empowerment agenda. You know, one of, one of the commitments we've made um, for the next two years is to double our host community in majority-minority districts so that um, the benefits from our platform are more widely spread throughout the globe. Um, and so it's thinking about ways that, um, that uh, underserved communities, communities all over the world can use the technology and use um, the innovation to be able to uh, economically benefit. And that's, that's what we've But seen. does it worry you this, of what's happened? Or is it just, you know, because they, ultimately this, these groups become more connected yet more, dis, more apart because it does create divisions that are, I, I, I joke that we hate each, we now we know each other, hate each other, but really I think social media has become weaponized well, in a know, major way. <laughs> Um, you know, and part, part of our mission is bringing people together and inclusiveness. Right. And you mentioned kind of the traveling around the world. And, and for us, um, and our CEO just kind of added um, to his title, um, head of community. Mm -hmm. And so that means kind of being with the community. And I think there are more different, say, there are more similarities than there are differences. And that means spending time together and, um, and, and listening and hearing um, what people's concerns are. So I'm optimistic. All right. Okay. All right. Devin? eBay was started as the first real community, one of the first marketplaces, mm -hmm. but a community, really, because there was a lot of, there was a lot of that, and Pierre started it with that concept yep. in mind. What do you think has happened to online community? Well, look, I, and can I it solve the offline problem? Because we don't have churches as much anymore, we don't have social groups, there's all kinds of divisions. I mean, look, pointing out that there are real issues in a bumpy transition doesn't mean we can't be optimists about what it ultimately can evolve to. And, and I guess what I'd say is, Part of this debate is really interesting because it's sort of this, a battle for the soul of, of tech. Mm -hmm. it, it, are we going to be in a drones and robots kind of cold world where we're all plugged in and uh, the, 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 uh, the pets of the robots? Or is the ultimate role of technology to actually uh, enable human beings and, and, and have them have more connection and have them have more meaningful lives? It doesn't mean it's easy, but I'm an optimist. I think we do need to stare the issues straight in the face. But when, when I hear about um, people being left behind, and when I hear about income inequality, and when I hear about robots, I don't recognize that in my business. You know, my business is a million small businesses who are plugged in and are self-sustaining and can hire one or two people because of technology, because of our platform. And I have as many customers in red states as blue states. I have as many customers who are young as old. It, we're one small piece of the equation, but I do think there's a future where tech eventually, through the bumps, can actually create jobs, create self-sustaining lives, and more meaningful lives. And that's, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I didn't believe that. All right, I'm gonna talk about one more topic in the negative, but then I want you to talk about what the positive trends that are coming you think are. I'll let you be optimistic. Um, universal basic income, another thing being pushed by Silicon Valley, it's being tested in Oakland with Y Combinator's uh, nonprofit arm, and then in Sweden, I think, and a couple places. Um, it's to give people money. You, everyone probably is, aware, I don't know if you're aware of it, it's to essentially give people money, a sustainable amount of money, and then figure out. A lot of people, they're trying it out by Y Combinator to see if it works, and then going to pass on their information to the government to see it is. But feels like communism to me. But, you know, I, mean, I can just see it being attacked but not politically. Um, can, who would like to talk about this idea? Because it's, it's an idea that a lot of people in Silicon Valley do talk about. 
Sure. So I don't pretend to know the answer here, um, but I can give you kind of how I've been thinking about it. So, so there's two main theories being pushed around right now, right? One is uh, universal basic income, which is just let's give cash to everyone, and uh, and the kind of opposing theory with the same intention is uh, is the negative tax rate, right? So one, below a certain amount, you actually get uh, you just get cash from the government proportionally to the amount you make. I think that both of them follow um, follow a couple principles that actually make a lot of sense, right? The first is that in a widening wealth gap, you're highly, highly incentivized if you're one of the haves and, and not the have-nots. You're highly incentivized to ensure that the have-nots do pretty well. Again, otherwise they show up at your door with pitchforks. So even if you don't want to do this out of the goodness of your hearts, you probably want to find a model to make this work and carry them with you. The second thing that's, uh, that's particularly interesting about it um, that I think... Uh, is, is kind of a transfer over the last few decades, is in the past when, we, um, when society decided to give social services, we gave them in the forms of education, healthcare, free transportation, et cetera. But now there's a big shift to saying, no, let's go ahead and let's just give hard cash under the presumption that people will know what to do with it better than us, or under an alternative presumption that you know, governments, whether city, state, federal, et cetera, are just highly inefficient in their spend. I think everywhere where these tests have been performed, whether it's Canada, whether it's Sweden, et cetera, the tests have done very, very well. That being said, I don't know that there's enough um, conclusive evidence, the same way that you could look at Canada and say people aren't shooting each other and they have plenty of guns, but in the US when we have guns, we all end up shooting each other. So there's cultural differences that aren't taken into account, which is why I actually think that the, the tests that Sam and others are doing are very, very interesting, um, though arguably until we try this at mass scale, we're not really gonna know the answers. Oscar? Yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting program, you know, that the World Bank started um, years ago. It's conditional cash transfers. Conditional cash transfers is pretty much they give money to, um, to mothers um, just with the condition that the kids, they have to go to the, visit the doctor, you know, a couple times a year. Um, they have to stay in school. So there, there's a lot of conditions that they have to meet, and, there's, uh, and if they do it, they receive money every month. So the program has been, has been around, you know, um, for at least 10, 15 years with great results. You know, they have reduced, um, mort you know, children mortality rate. Also, you know, they have increased, um, you know, kids in school. So there's a lot of proof, you know, that uh, giving money away with certain motivation, you know, actually works. Uh, I don't know about the universal, in you know, income, which is, uh, I'm gonna give you money for doing nothing. It, you know, I agree with you that it could feel, uh, you know, like communism, but I think experimenting with some mechanisms that are hybrid, you know, that it's like, okay, this is, your, this is the role that you have as a member of the society, and this is the expectation we have for you. If you meet all these requirements, then you're entitled to get a certain amount of money, you know, to fulfill your basic needs. Uh, I think these kind of programs, you know, to find out a hybrid, you know, I think it's, uh, it's what we, ha we will we'll have to do, because at the end of the day, people are going to lose their jobs, and, you know, it's not easy to, for, just to tell them, hey, by the way, learn, you know, become a doctor, and you can make more money. So uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not simple. So I th I'm, I'm all for um, uh, testing and implementing, you know, these you kind of programs. You also need healthcare that works. Absolutely. You need, you need a lot of basic services, you know, that works, like accommodation is one of them, uh, education and, and, and access to healthcare. So um, if you, uh, as a member of society, you have all these basic needs, you know, covered, then, you know, you can be a productive member of a such society. So I, I, I'm all for it, um, and I think we should uh, at least start experimenting, you know, because, you know, we don't have much time. Mm -hmm. Belinda? Yeah. I mean, I think... Um yeah, this is a, a very good debate and a lot of smart thinkers are out there thinking about this. Another one, if you, the National Bureau of Economic Research just came out with this interesting study that said um, for every one robot in 1,000 workers, six jobs are displaced. And so when thinking about some of the um, solutions that have been proposed around a robot tax and then what to take, I'm not advocating that, but I think it's an interesting robot idea. Robot tax, if Bill Gates was talking Yes, about. Bill Gates. Yeah. And do you, you, then you take that. I think we should and, tax Bill Gates <laughs> and that'll be, take care of everything. And, uh, and use it to help create jobs and, 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 if it's, and, and maybe towards a UBI or something along those lines. But I think there, um, we need to be thinking about these solutions now. I obviously don't have the solution, but I think it's, um, it's a great discussion and, and it isn't just about the UBI, but it's about how do we right. think about the, 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 um, the taxing potentially. Right, the so tax robots, tax drones, tax whatever you can that's not, that's made of metal. Something like that. <laughs> well, no, or, or, or use that to build solutions for the jobs that are displaced. Right, right. Hans? 
Um, you know, only any, any one of us have uh, the perfect answer, but I think it's the efforts of try is important. At the end of the day, um, uh, a lot of people forget that how eBay and, and Audi started is really lower the, um, um, the uh, hurdle to, uh, through trading um, to improve your own right. life. And that's an extremely powerful concept. And I, I mean, being in China for, for eight years, I see firsthand how this country, that country changed dramatically because of that simple concept. And um, how do you permeate that through more people in the society? Um, we, we make fun of a lot of social um, media apps these days. Uh, the influencers getting younger, 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 younger. You have eight-year-old, nine-year-old, 10-year-old active online now. But at the same time, it's amazing to watch how they f follow one of their peer that they have never met before being active online and doing something that capture all their attention. How did that person do it so well? Mm -hmm. So in some sense, having more people um, at a younger age to be able to learn how to do that online and figure out a way to change their life in some way, leveraging um, online media, is a, could be the next powerful concept to allow more ways to, um, to monetize um, that kind of traffic online. Mm -hmm. it, if that down the road could end up having, producing more people who will be either entrepreneurs or join the next um, great um, internet, internet or tech startup, maybe somehow that permeation into um, the so-called red states or flyover states could eventually make a difference. It's not a, I don't have a good answer for what can be solved tomorrow, but seeing more millennials and preteens being active and seeing very little difference mm -hmm. in some of the preteens, their behavior online between someone in New York, Alabama, Beijing, Shanghai, Chengdu, is actually encouraging. Can you make, uh, one of the things I think about is I don't think you can be successful going forward without being entrepreneurial. I think that's one of our big yes. problems. So how do we teach entrepreneurial? But when, how do when, we when, get it through to people? If, 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 if yes. someone who's eight, nine year old um, seeing someone else with the same age doing something incredible on whether it's Musical.ly or Insta or, 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 or Snap, it inspires them to want to try it too. And being, not being afraid to put yourself out there and do things and getting um, accolades from your peers is a very powerful reinforcing concept. Mm -hmm. And I think as adults, we worry how our kids spend way too much online, but seeing how they feel empowered, um, I think that's probably, probably the biggest lesson they will learn from in, in beyond just going to school and learning math. And Can English. you teach entrepreneurialism? Because a lot of what you do is on people being entrepreneurial with their homes or being entrepreneurial with healthcare or, or, or something like that. Can you teach entrepreneurialism? Well, I, I think it isn't just teaching, but it's also giving people the opportunity, right? So um, we, uh, we do see a lot of hosts that are using the extra income to build their businesses and to start, I think we had 50,000 entrepreneurs from hosting income um, from our most recent study. And for women entrepreneurs, um, we've done recent studies on this. Women raised two, $10 billion on the platform since inception. So I think it's, it's, um, it's not just teaching, but it's also giving the financial opportunity. And we're seeing more and more um, the additional income being used for entrepreneurship. Is there something in the education system that we should change? And then I'm gonna to get to questions from the audience in a second. Yeah, it's interesting that you say, can we teach um, entrepreneurialism? Uh, when I think Because it's usually seen as, oh, this one crazy person was by themselves and they bucked the system and here yeah. they are. <laughs> when, you, when you think of humans, like humans are inherently entrepreneurial, right? Well, cockroachian really is what I feel. <laughs> sure. <laughs> from, from, you know, the first fires we made to the first meals we cooked, these, we never had the guidebook, right? That's kind of what we do uh, as humans. And so... It's not so much that I think you need to teach entrepreneurialism. I think the only reason we even say those words is because Silicon Valley has just taken the word and adopted it and patted ourselves on the back as being innovators. Uh, but the truth is we're all innovators, right? No matter what industry we're in, everybody has this kind of inherent creativity. The thing that we can do is provide more societal structure for that and uh, make it easier for people to be successful at it. But everyone's doing it on a daily basis. In fact, if you, think of, if you take a step back and think of what technology is, the vast majority of technology is just creating tools, right? And so whether that's a tool to, to let somebody into your home, whether that's things that we don't even think of as high tech anymore, right? The car. What what is a car? Well, 
You could be a pessimist and you could say that it's a 3,000 pound weapon that you know, every home owns two of, or you can look at it and say, well, it enabled freedom, it enabled jobs, it enabled rescue services, enabled all sorts of different utilities that were created by all these micro entrepreneurs. And so when I think of what, what do I want for our kids and what, do we, what should we be doing in the education system, it's not so much that we should teach this, it's more that we should just support it when people are already doing it. Yeah, I do think it's teachable, but we're gonna, uh, we're gonna get to questions in one second, but very briefly I wanna go everyone to go through it. Actually, the car company CEO is trying to stay relevant right now. Every one of them, when they meet me, they said, you know, the car is the first mobile device. <laughs> 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 I was like, I have never heard that. That's amazing. <laughs> no, it's not. No, my sink never works in my friggin' Ford, so no, it's not. Um, what is the most exciting technology that you think is coming in the scariest? Very briefly, and then we'll get to questions. Even though it's not my company or directly my industry, I personally think CRISPR and gene editing is yeah. extraordinarily existential to the planet. All right. Both scary and promising. Yeah. Yeah. What would you edit, Devin? I don't know, Kara. Okay. <laughs> Invisibility cloak when you're around me. So, go ahead. I think that's probably the most scary. The second one is probably a variation of AI where... Various of what? Very variation of artificial intelligence. The different Gina. kinds of artificial intelligence. But the way if you can train, the, train someone to, to think, like, uh, think like a machine, train someone to figure out how to do stuff from scratch um, through simulation on their own, it, it is scary to think of what is the how do you control and lead that to what something. about promising what was that what about promising anything don't know hans is not finding don't anything know. promising go ahead <laughs> for me a precision medicine is you know the most exciting thing that is yeah. coming um, the scary you know the scary is um the the level of access to information we have and the lack of critical thinking you know in the society that's the scariest piece so i uh, I think the most interesting thing, um, and I, I'm biased because I'm working on it, is just understanding ourselves. We make so many claims about society, so many claims about the world, but at a, at a truly fundamental level, we barely understand who we are and why we're walking around, whether this is genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, the, the, the general category of omics and just kind of understanding ourselves is incredibly powerful. So I'm excited about AI and education. I have um, two kids, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing more customized um, ways to teach. Right now, our school system's kind of, it's a room, and everyone's getting taught the same yeah. way, if, even though everybody learns really differently. So if AI can help understand how each individual learns and customize education towards that individual, I think that's really exciting. Would you like a neural network plugged into the back of your neck? Or the learning companion, or no? No, it's I, a I thing that, well, <laughs> Elon talks about it. It's a thing yeah, that goes um, in the back. <laughs> Yeah, Matrix. Maybe I'm not ready for that. Really? Yeah. Totally want that. <laughs> um, I'm scared by the lack of responsibility of tech executives about what they're doing. I remember when Facebook Live was first started to be things, and I, of course, said, you know, someone's going to kill someone on this thing. And the Facebook executive I was talking to was like, Kara, you're just so cynical. And I was like, no, no, you're not even <laughs> thinking about that. And it, they were like, don't think about things like that. I'm like, but I am. They're going to kill someone. And so it's an interest, it's like not even occurring. Right. Like, that's the part I get yes. worried about. All right, questions from the audience right here. There's going to be a, he's coming with a microphone. Hey there, my name is Rockwell Shaw. So in a world where people are kicking food delivery robots down the street, mm -hmm. what are tech leaders doing to change the, the framing and the way that people care about technology and their feelings towards technology. Like what, what Putting are we a doing happy now? face on the robot. No. <laughs> by, by the way, the robot's going to kick back someday, just so you know. But go ahead. What do, what do you think? You know, I think it's about giving back and making sure that as you're building technology, you're thinking about social impact, whether that's philanthropy or um, building social impact into um, the work that each technology company is doing. There's so much opportunity to do that. And so... Um, so perhaps that might help. The is Airbnb doing that? Um, yeah, yeah we, I mean, we just launched uh, Experiences, which is um, uh, where people can not just host their homes, but host experiences. And as part of that, we're committed to having social impact experiences that people can go into communities and um, give their time and give back to the community and we don't take fees. And so it's, it, you know, it's, it's things like that um, that can make a difference. I, I mean, look, I, think, I do think that... Uh, 
as the tech industry begins to mature, it just has to play a bigger role in society and not just in our own businesses. You know, for us, what that means is eBay is one of the biggest charitable platforms in the world. We've given, directed a billion dollars, not through our own giving, but through a platform that people can direct giving. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, our founder has created one of the great charitable uh, foundations in the world, Omidio Foundation. And, and look, it's, it's not about PR. It's not about burnishing the image of the company. It's about being a responsible citizen, if you're going to create a global platform and change a lot of things around the planet, you also have to take responsibility for the type of planet that you leave. And I think that's really core to our, our values. Pure is unusual. Business. Let's be honest. Pure is one of the few adults in Silicon Valley, really. Yeah. But I do think that you're seeing more of it. I, you know, again, I'm an optimist. I don't, there's no doubt you can point out plenty of tech bros and I don't give a shit and all of that. But I think that as these companies get more powerful, they're also starting to grow up. It may be a painful adolescence, but they're growing up. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Question? Sorry. Any questions? Um, all right, I will ask anybody else on that question on the idea of what can be done to make tech trends hurt a lot less? Hans? Um, just going back to what a tech companies could be could be doing. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't have the data, but I, I'll be very curious to see um, among the listed tech companies, what is the percentage of people that um, they hire out of uh, the big state schools? Not, not the Ivy Leagues, not, not the top 10, 20 schools, but the next 80. Um, when you see your friends from your neighborhood end up going to one of the top companies in the world and work, I think that provides a very powerful motivation um, in a way that's, um, that changes the way they, uh, you think about it. Because it's not, I'm left behind, it's not we are left behind, it's that, hey, he's doing something about it, but I'm not. And that, that creates a very different way of managing your own career. Yeah, uh, again, I, I don't think we're doing uh, enough. I think it's, uh, for example, you know, the billion dollars that uh, uh, eBay has enabled, you know, uh, I didn't know about it, and I, I'm, you know, well-versed in the technology space, mm -hmm. and I had no idea, you know, so I think technology companies, uh, should do more uh, PR. I mean, they're great at doing PR, but uh, they, you know, for some reason, you know, we don't advertise the good things that uh, that is that are happening, you know, in, in the company. So I think companies they should communicate more, you know, to the uh, to the users and, and let them know that uh, they're part of something that is giving back, you know, to, to society. So I think it's, it's about communication both ways. I, don't, I, I haven't seen that, you know, especially, you know, you can have, you can, you know, uh, all these companies, right, sharing, you know, there's the pros and the cons. Um, the reality is, as you said, it, you know, it, it, there's a, thousands of jo jobs that were created. So um, there's positive and negative. Uh, we need only to, put, you know, right now we're biased to pay attention to the negative. I think companies, and um, they should actually package the message also when they do good things. So it's about communication. Adrian? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that, um, I think that societies generally, um, so I, I'm definitely an optimist, uh, similar to you. I think that basically everybody in technology is almost by definition an optimist. But um, one of the things that we keep pointing out is we think that the tech companies should get more and more responsible, that they should become better and better actors. And I'm not sure that's actually the right solution, right? Um, I'm not sure I ever want huge, huge companies being the, the uh, empowered bodies of society, right? Um, I actually think it comes back to this notion I mentioned earlier of the more that we empower the individual, the better. And actually, the tech companies are uh, kind of by definition doing this every single day. And you see, it, you see it in some of these companies where their users have far more control than the company, right? If I look at Twitter, God knows that their users are really in control of that platform, and yeah. they, they can barely control them at all. Yes, and therefore it's a hellscape, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hellscape, but there's pros to that hellscape, right? right? There's pros to a decentralized society. There's pros to, to a notion where there's not one single product manager sitting there saying, I am going to convince everybody on the planet to hit this button, et cetera. True, when, but you're not Leslie Jones, but go ahead. When you think of the power that uh, technology companies have, right? So, so uh, we all use dating apps, and then all of a sudden, that means a technology company, a software engineer somewhere decided who I'm going to marry, right? And then, you know, I want to go out to dinner and I go to Yelp. That means some software engineer told me where I'm going to eat, and then some software engineer at Uber told me how I'm going to get there. At some point, you start to realize that, that it's actually very scary 
uh, to, to trust large companies with all, of this, uh, with all of this control. But the nice trend that's been occurring um, more in the last few years is that um, these, because the communication rate's so high and because people are so empowered these days with the tools of, of having a loud voice online or voting with their feet or voting with their dollars, I think you're actually seeing a good amount of that power leave and come back to the people, and that's actually a great thing. All right, very last question that we're going to get off is what would you like to see invented if you could pick anything and try to be creative here? One thing that you'd like to see invented. Adrian? Yeah, so the one thing that I spend a lot of time thinking about is, um, is why has technology not produced, um, uh, like why is AI, why have algorithms never produced good design? We just haven't seen it yet. And so um, design today is one of the, you know, when you think of a lot of the technology industry, it's a lot of math, and it's a lot of science, it's a lot of predictability, and then you get design, just pure creativity, it's hard. All right, Belinda? It's gotta be something around air travel and aviation. <laughs> yeah. So uh, an airline where you don't get beat up, say. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> just that, that makes it more pleasurable to more travel. More pleasurable, you're right. It's like yeah. another hellscape, absolutely. All right. To be I would say a time machine, adopted. but go ahead. Uh, <laughs> d d teleportation. Teleportation, that's a good one too. <laughs> you can't say jetpack, Hans. <laughs> Health, healthcare. It's, just, um, it's, it's all around the world, it's becoming a green society. And there's just so much knowledge over the last uh, uh, 50 years of, of, of data on how hospitals treat a variety of diseases, how that could be the data could be leveraged much better to service the next uh, uh, generation of patients, I think will be critical. Well, I want something more like printing livers or what? Or replacing arms or three <laughs> arms? like ages. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Yeah. Okay, you get to finish. Um, something good. I'm good? No, I'm not good. Uh, you know, the laws of physics do allow for any object to be deconstructed at a subatomic level and reconstructed. I think... Imagine that, it would create a borderless world. Imagine the ability to move anywhere seamlessly a la Star Trek. That is going to happen eventually. It might be a thousand years away, but that is going to happen. Teleportation. Yeah. All right, you Star Trek people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nerds. All right, nerds. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you.